Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UNC Virtual Science Expo. My name is Jonathan Frederick. I'm the director of the North Carolina Science Festival. You may not know it, but you're in the thick of a month of statewide science brought to you by Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. One of the events we're most excited about is today's all day long extravaganza where we meet researchers like the ones we're about to meet right now. Before I begin, I wanna point out that I'm in a so physically distant space with only a few other people and we're all fully vaccinated, which is such a, a privilege and um, interesting to say. We still wear our masks. We still keep our distance from each other. But just while I'm on camera, I'm going to take my mask off so that you can see me and maybe understand me just a little bit better. This session that you're attending is called STEM One and STEM For All. And I have to tell you both personally and professionally, um, we're passionate at Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center about the ideas of inclusion. And we also love the idea of thinking that you're never too early to start thinking about STEM and exploring. And so this group that we're about to meet does that with their expertise and with their personal commitment. So we're very, very excited about this. Um, let me say a few words about the program. Um, the STEM Innovation for Inclusion and Early Education Center from the FPG T Child Development Institute, which is kind of like right that way across a beautiful quad right here on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill. They're focused on ensuring all children with and without disabilities can access and participate in STEM learning opportunities. And so right now, they're going to describe how and why STEMI is working to accomplish this goal. I can't wait to hear about it. The session will include specific resources and strategies for early childhood educators and families to support all children in STEM learning. Um, if anyone on the, on the session has any questions, um, if you've found us through the webinar link, you can drop those into the Q&A feature. If you're watching via YouTube, please send your questions to ncscifest at unc.edu. I almost gave away our website. ncscifest.org is our website. If you want to submit questions, ncscifest at unc.edu. Um, we have a team of experts excited to meet you. Let me first kick it over to Dr. Ching Lim, who's going to say hello to everyone and then tell us about her team. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We are so excited to be here with you all on the Friday afternoon. And um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Hang on a sec. It, the screen sharing has disappeared. And maybe while you're sharing, Ching, we mm -hmm. can introduce ourselves. So, yep. um, so hi everyone. I'm Megan Vin, and with Ching, I'm the we are the co-directors of the STEM Innovation for Inclusion in Early Education Center, or you'll hear us refer to it as STEMI throughout the project or throughout this talk, um, actually, and throughout our project as well, we refer to it as STEMI. <laughs> um, and we're joined, and I don't know, Jessica and Shuen, if you guys want to introduce yourselves, we are also joined by our postdoctoral fellows, Jessica Amsbury and uh, Shuen Yang, who are going to help us with this uh, discussion throughout the, throughout the next hour. Go ahead, Jessica. Hey everyone, my name is Jessica. Yes, I'm one of the postdocs on STEMI. Um, and yeah, I'll be here for the next hour to learn more about <laughs> STEM and inclusion for young children. <laughs> Shoen? Hello, I'm Shoen and I am the postdoc on STEMI as well and really looking forward to share more about um, inclusion on children's STEM learning. Yep. Thanks everyone. So we'll, we are going to have a marvelous time today in this next one hour. And um, so, um, you know, thanks uh, Jonathan for introducing um, our center. And we are a national center that is funded by the US Department of Education, Office of Special Edu Education Programs. And um, we have partners at the University of Denver, um, the Masico Institute, and we are a fairly multidisciplinary team as well. So we've done all the welcome. And um, so as Jonathan shared earlier, um, we do have some session objectives, which is really to um, just share with you why this work is really important uh, and why it is important to include all young children, especially those with disabilities and with STEM experiences. And uh, we are going to share some strategies and practices for adapting early STEM learning to increase accessibility and participation for all, cho um, all children. 
and also to explain how you can integrate STEM into daily routines and activities. And we are going to do that um, by sharing some of the resources that we have developed over the past year. So um, maybe just a quick like uh, if you could, could tap, uh, type into the chat box, uh, if you could just let us know where you're from and what your role is in early childhood. Or maybe what your role is in STEM. Okay, maybe we could move along and uh, you could uh, just um, continue to share that information with us. So, you know, like for me, I used to be a math and music teacher in high school and um, like, you know, the um, Jessica used to be an early intervention um, provider uh, who works with home-based um, services and she was a pediatric occupational therapist and Megan was, a TA specialist who works more like at the systems level um, to help states um, include young children with disabilities into their programs. So you can tell that, you know, we do have a wide variety of um, kind of um, backgrounds and experiences, yeah. So in terms of our um, center outcomes, uh, we are funded to ensure that uh, we increase the body of knowledge of current evidence-based practices. Um, and so what we are doing is to, um, we are um, looking at um, state early guidelines, so really looking very closely at what some of the indicators um, that are in the state early le learning guidelines um, to um, guide um, practitioners as well as faculty um, in their work. And then we also have like a couple of different needs assessments that we are doing as well. And um, really, I think the incre um, increasing the body of knowledge is really critical because when we did a scoping review very early on in the project, we found that only about 6% of the um, research and um, references were focused on young children with disabilities and even a, an even smaller percentage of um, I think it was barely 3% that, that was focused on infants and, young, um, and toddlers. So we know that, you know, that there is really a need for research in this area. Um, and then another one of our objectives is to ensure that um, there's an increase used by um, programs as well as providers and families um, in terms of like the current evidence-based practices in early STEM learning and also to increase that awareness um, and ability of um, faculty in um, institutes of higher education in order um, for them to um, teach um, others how to um, um, embed STEM learning into daily routines and activities. So what we know is that children are active learners and um, the infant, toddler, as well as preschool years, and they explore their environments and learn things from doing, seeing, and touching. And you, you know that, you know, like babies, you see them um, kind of dropping a spoon um, from their high chair and, you know, and then waiting for somebody to pick it up. And um, I know as a parent, that was kind of, you know, you get a little um, frustrated with that when they keep doing it over and over again. But Essentially, you know, that is just how they're trying to uh, make sense of the world. And, you know, it's about cause and effect. So those earliest um, days of kind of learning, those, those are actually STEM ex experiences. Um, and, you know, by providing them these experiences, you know, it can really tap into their natural curiosity and give them opportunities to be engaged um, in their own learning. And um, also we know that um, teaching science 
as well as um, technology, engineering, and math early on in the early years. It's really associated with gains um, in um, many different um, areas of learning um, as they move through the school. And there's also been positive impact on children's executive function skills, which is, we know is so critical, um, not just for learning, but also for lifelong skills. But yet there is a, a STEM opportunity gap for some children, children who are living in poverty, who are members of linguistic and ethnic minority, minority groups and children with disabilities they all have fewer opportunities to engage in STEM learning um, activities as compared to their peers. And we can see that these um, opportunity gap continues to widen as children move through um, the school ages in elementary, middle and high school. And here you see that, you know, we are really using the word denied very intentionally because children we have seen children being pulled out for separate um, interventions and also um, just adults perceiving that STEM is way too difficult for young children with disabilities. And we see that this opportunity gap, um, as I was saying, it has, um, it continues to widen. So this is some data from the US Department of Ed Office of C Civil Rights data collection. And, and you see here how um, in terms of the disparity in STEM opportunities for older um, children with disabilities in that they represent only a very small percentage of um, students enrolled in um, what we know as the more like advanced STEM courses. And, and so if you compare that to other high schoolers, um, that is about like maybe about 90 plus percent of um, um, high schoolers as compared to, um, you see like with um, kids with disabilities, um, they do represent like much, um, much lower percentages in these courses. And so um, although there isn't like much research on STEM learning for young children with disabilities, um, there are signs that these children are being left out of STEM learning experiences early on. And I know like recently, Megan and I have been um, really very passionate about, you know, like talking about this, especially um, not just, I think of the opportunities in the classroom, but even like um, researchers have been leaving, leaving um, kids with disabilities out of their studies. Um, so we know that, you know, there is a lot of work ahead of us um, at the center and beyond. And so before I turn things over to Shu Wen, I'd like to just share um, why this work is important through the perspective of families, um, some people with disabilities, some of them who are STEM professionals, as well as early childhood practitioners. Yeah. So that's what you like to do, right? Yeah. So I do like this. Yeah. It's something that isn't really talked too much about in early childhood special education, but it's so important to look at how we can integrate STEM into early childhood. To be honest, the um, first time I hear it, it's STEM in, in uh, like elementary school and middle school, but in early head start or early head, uh, early education, I never heard about it. So I don't think in uh, early childhood uh, there's a good uh, understanding about implementing uh, STEM. There's not a whole lot of creative for educators even today on what includes STEM. One of my teachers, she offered doing a robotics one, but the like the school denied it. So if she did that, then yes, a lot of uh, my friends would have started going to STEM. I know a lot of parents who like whose kids are very much interested, but I mean, we ourselves, we had that issue when he was interested, but we couldn't really take the time out and go do it all. I used to think I was not good at math. A lot of people told me that math is really hard for people with Down syndrome, and I believe that. For blind kids, a lot of the world is hearsay. You hear about the Batmobile, about the Millennium Falcon, or about a car. Like, nah, I can't do that. That's for sighted kids. 
learn how to adapt and how to not compare myself to how other people are doing. I got a lot of resistance from the teachers saying they can't engage in STEM, they're not going to experiment with things. And you can't blame the school because the schooling system is overwhelmed. You can't blame the parents because parents are trying their best. So because they have, there's so much that they have to do in a relatively short period of time, sometimes the system's not set up to have them just explore something of interest. The children with disabilities who don't really have a lot of opportunities to explore their interests or really problem solve or, you know, engage it with materials that are more open-ended. You know, kids are kind of, I've seen that they kind of get averse to it because they're like, that's too much of work on my end they are not exposed to the fun that you could get out of it. It's important that we don't reserve STEM learning for certain kinds of kids. Technology plays a big part in my ability to make up for my physical disability. And that model of education really let me grow and figure out where I want to be. If you have goals that look at literacy, and if you have goals that look at, you know, developing, you know, friendships or social interactions, this actually can really be a very powerful vehicle. A lot of the kids with disabilities are, are visual learners like me, so STEM is perfect. Yeah. And thanks, Ching. And I wanted to just jump in quick and say, um, as, as Ching, you, you know, you talked about earlier, the language that we at SEMI are using is really intentional because it is really important that we um, think about that STEM, like, um, you know, uh, Jonathan said what he introduced us, STEM really is for all and it starts early. You know, as Ching said, kids are naturally exploring the world. Um, you know, as infants. And so we think it's important to really be intentional um, about that early on. And so we call it STEM. We often get a lot of questions about, um, isn't it just cognitive development or isn't it this? And well, yes, all of that is um, connected at this age. It's really critical that we call it STEM so that people recognize um, that STEM is for everyone. Um, and so we think that's why we're really excited to be here during Science Week, because this really is promoting that um, we can engage in science and STEM and support everyone and having some kind of, I think like the mom in the video said, having some, seeing the fun you can have with this. Um, and I know Shoen, I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point, but I did wanna make sure that we said, that we just reiterated that the language we think is really important. Thank you, Megan. And um, like watching and Megan um, talk about um, the STEM Center, we really want to make sure that STEM is for everyone. Every children have uh, access and can fully participate in STEM learning opportunities. So from the video, you can tell like there are a lot of misconceptions for children with disabilities. For example, uh, children with disabilities cannot learn STEM. And another misconception about STEM learning is that STEM, STEM is so expensive. Like when we talk about STEM, uh, the first thing we might think about is to go to buy expensive toys, expensive robot, and a lot of fancy toys. So in that, then people can engage children's STEM learning in that way. But actually, what we want to show you is this is not the case that actually STEM learning can be er everywhere, can be exist, can exist in every day in daily routine and daily activities. So um, in the next slide, uh, we are going to show you a short video clip. If you're watching a video recording or if you're watching uh, YouTube live, um, we would like you to think about these questions when you are um, watching the video clip. Um, so we want you to think about like, um, in these activities, what do you see this child is doing? And what kind of strategies do you see the mom is using? And then how was the mom providing an opportunity for STEM learning? So we want you to think about those questions and really think about how STEM learning can embed in 
um, in daily activity and routines. And it doesn't really need to go out to buy expensive toys in order to let your child to learn STEM. Um, so chain on uh, next. All right, so let's watch this video and really think about the question that I just um, asked in the previous slide. Okay, but you ready to eat? Yeah. Do you want some prints? I'm gonna scoop some out for you, okay? Yeah. You see it? It's brown. Okay. Yes. Okay. So while you're watching the video, thinking about those questions, um, what, how is this activity of STEM learning opportunity? Like, what do you see this child is doing? So from this video, we can see that this child is probably having a breakfast and then he's probably trying to use tool to kind of scoop out the, um, the puree and then using his hands to explore the environment, to kind of uh, explore the puree to see how it feels like. Then the strategies that you can tell from the videos from the mom is using, mom using a lot of interaction. She interacting with his little, this little boy a lot and using a lot of STEM related vocabulary in the conversations. For example, that she mentioned the color, this is brown, and she mentioned the texture, this is smooth. And she also mentioned the scoop, scoop that out. And then also mentioned the cold, this is temperature. So these are all like wonderful STEM related vocabularies. And we also want you to think about like, so we know that this mom is doing a really, really, really good job to support children's STEM learning uh, while children, while this little boy is having a breakfast to kind of talk about STEM related vocabularies. So um, Megan, I would like you, to, what else do you think that this mom could do to support children's STEM learning? Or Jessica or Ching? Like, I would like you to, I would like a conversation. Like, what else do you think that this mom could do to support children's mm -hmm. I'm still learning. Thanks, Shoen. Um, <laughs> and I know all of you listening may not know, but they said me first because you'll find during this call that um, I'm the one that likes to talk probably the most. <laughs> um, so, um, but I think that's a really good question. And one of the things that I saw that I think is really important, and I don't know if everyone caught it, um, was maybe less about, well, I mean, I saw all the STEM, but it was the piece around how the child was, I mean, how the mom was really um, incur making STEM accessible, where she sort of pushed things closer to the child, recognizing that, you know, he, he could interact with the STEM and interact with the world around him if we made sure that it was closer to him. And so there were some of those um, things that I saw that I think are really important. That was a simple, um, maybe, adaptation to make, but it was um, critical to his sort of engagement with, um, like you said, showing the puree or the tools or the, you know, things. Yeah, that's a good point, Megan. I think, uh, yes, uh, thank you for bringing that up, the adaptation piece, even the, like, either including the, the toy, the tool that it, he is using, right? So uh, with a bigger handle, so it will be easier for him to use the tool and to use the tool to, um, um, to try to explore the environment, yes. And another thing I think about this mom like could do, like uh, could ask more questions uh, when uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you still, if you guys still remember, like during a video, there's a certain time that there's a noise and then the child is trying to look 
um, what's going on on the floor, there's a noise on the floor. So I think they will be another good opportunity for the mom to ask more questions or provide an explanation of what's going on and what's happening. Oh, something dropped, so it, it produces a noise and it produces sound. Yes. Uh, anything else if or Jessica Ching would like to share with us from the video or the questions? I wanted to also add, show in. Okay. <laughs> I was, I waited as long as I could, everyone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think what's really also important to think about is we're talking about a different age range. Um, and so we're talking birth to five. And so this child was um, younger. And I think it was thinking about what's developmentally appropriate. What is sort of STEM, what's happening um, in terms of exploring the world around you and some other things that are happening at these ages. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that next, but I also wanted to sort of um, share that, you know, we think it's really important to sort of um, intentionally think about what children are doing and then take that to the next step. And I know, Jessica, you're going to share about more about everyday routines and activities. And so I just wanted to maybe share that I'm sure sometimes when we show some of our videos, some people are thinking, well, where's, what's the STEM? And I know, Shoen, you did a great job of um, discussing that, but I think it's really about thinking about what is the developmentally appropriate ways that we're supporting and facilitating children's, like you said, show in STEM vocabulary or um, experiences um, to so set them um, to really support them and set them up for success when they're in K-12 as well and beyond. Okay, thank you, Megan. All right, so we also have another video that we'll, we would like to show you. So while you're watching the video, also, also consider the questions that we just asked in the previous slide, and we will have a short discussion about this. Okay. All right. So, uh, Ching, can you go to the next slide on the questions? Thank you. Yes. So, um, on the video, you can see that uh, the teacher is uh, encourage, encouraging the child to exploring the water, right? So, while that he, she is encouraging the children to try to in, to try and experiment the water, she also ask the questions about the temperature. Is it hot? And then we're using other STEM related vocabulary in the conversations too. So um, so what else do you think that these uh, teachers could do to support children's STEM learning? So one thing I'm thinking about that um, maybe in the in this, this is a great teaching moment for uh, children's STEM learning. So perhaps a teacher can also ask about what will happen if we add a cold waters Oh, we can, oh, or the teachers can also talk about water. Is it water liquid? Or also we can add a little bit of tool or different containers to kind of uh, teach a child the measurement uh, kind of concept, scoop it out, and uh, which is bigger and which is smaller and by using in and interacting with waters. Um, so anything else want to add? Uh, from this video, Ching, Jessica, and Megan. Yeah, I think, you know, I like how the teacher was actually kind of modeling for the kids, like, because um, some looked a little hesitant about, you know, trying to put their hand in the water, um, but the teacher kind of modeled for the kid um, that, ooh, look, you know, it's, I think both the modeling of like putting the hand in as well as, um, the word for how do you describe um, the temperature of the water. I thought that was, you know, great in that short, like 30 second video. Yes, that's a really good point. The modeling too. Like, yeah, that's a really good strategy. And I really like this video too. So I hope these two videos can kind of give you a sense of what STEM looks like in um, classroom in daily routines. And later on, Jessica will gonna will show us a lot more resource uh, regarding how to include STEM learning in storybook reading and daily routines and activities. Um, but I'm going to turn 
to uh, Megan, and uh, she's going to share something about inclusion and uh, for and STEM learning. Thanks, Shoen. Um, and I'm going to just share, um, and we put this in here so that um, folks could come back to it too, and you can find it on our webpage. But we have a series sort of on thinking about why inclusion. And I think it's really important that we share that there's a lot of research on um, inclusion in early childhood and that inclusion is really beneficial um, for all children, not just children with disabilities, but there are benefits for children without disabilities. And so it's really important that we start um, kind of continuing on to recognize the research around inclusion. Um, something that I think, as Ching was saying, has come up with a, come up for us is that in a lot of research um, on STEM, what we found was that we are excluding children with disabilities from that sample. And so then I think there's some, what goes around on with that is also thinking, well, um, then it perpetuates that myth that maybe STEM is not for all kids. And so um, we wanted to really make sure that we shared that um, inclusion research has shown that being included um, in everyday routines and activities and with your peers is critical. Um, and it is, you know, the outcomes are the same, if not better than when you're excluded from those pieces, at least the research, and that is exactly what the research has shown. And so we have a three-part video series that talks about how you can change attitudes and beliefs. What are those benefits of inclusion? Um, and then also have talked about some of the you know things that have been shown to be really effective in inclusion as well. And so if you want to go the next one, Ching, um, I'm going to share a little bit about what we're working on on STEMI so that um, we're hoping that um, folks listening that you'll connect with us as well, because we have a lot of things that are um, um, a lot of things happening. Um, but if you go to the next one, Ching. Um, a big piece of the work that we're doing, um, and actually I know Ching um, um, in the beginning talked about our partners. Well, there is um, a thing um, called learning trajectories. You can find learning trajectories in math already at learningtrajectories.org. Um, but one of the things that we're funded to do and that we're working on is really thinking about what does that look like for the STE. and and so a learning trajectories approach um, or framework or whatever word you want to use there, because we've had lots of discussions on what the language is about that. But really what it is, is um, it's sort of a three part um, thing. So what it helps us to think about is what's the goal? So what are those big um, content areas that um, or big overarching goals that we have for um, children in STEM for this age, and we're looking birth to five, um, but also connecting it to what we know is happening um, in kindergarten and beyond. We know there are standards for those things, but what are those goals? And then we're thinking about the developmental progression, which allows us to think about where is the child and where do you go to, re you know, how do we support children in reaching that goal? I want to be clear that this is not linear. <laughs> so um, sometimes we get the question of, well, are there separate developmental progressions for children with disabilities? And we think that's no, for sure not. That really what it is, is us thinking about where is the child? And, and one of our colleagues talks about it like a garden path. Maybe you're off on the, um, on a stepping stone and you've gotten off the path or whatever that might be, but it's really about thinking about where the child is and how we can support them in moving towards that goal. And that's what those instructional strategies or teaching is. It's what can I as the practitioner or caregiver do to facilitate that movement or that progression. And so um, again, I am trying to really convey that it's not linear, um, but that it is a um, sort of a strengths-based way of thinking about where is a child and how can I support them in being engaged and moving forward. And with that, um, if you go to the next one, Ching, um, our, a big thing that we have is, um, or, and actually this is what the research really shows is that when we think about inclusion, um, it is you know, best practice and in inclusion or the evidence-based practice around that um, really helps us to see that it's not about changing the child. It's not saying this is the thing that that child needs to work on. It's really about what can I do to make sure that all children have access and can participate and engage. Um, and so it's really reflecting on what I can do as the practitioner. And so the things that we have incorporated, and this again is using the um, evidence base, is thinking about, for me as a beginning, what do I need to change about my environment or my activities or my routines to make sure that all children can engage in what I'm doing or can even access it? Um, 
are there something I need to do with, you know, then think about, is there something I need to do with the materials to make them accessible and engaging? And then the last thing is thinking about what do I need to do with my instruction? Um, is it, you know, do I, what do I need to do? Like Ching, you talked about modeling. How can I really support a child in engaging um, with, with their peers in these activities? Um, because like we keep saying, all kids can engage in STEM. And I know Jessica, you're gonna show a little bit about how, but I think it's critical that we think about what can we do to make sure everybody has um, access and engagement. All right, if you wanna go to the next one. Um, and so like we said, that happens at the instructional tasks um, level. And it also helps us think about where is a child, right? So we need to start with where a child is. Um, and this is for all children, um, I think. And really, as we're talking about this, this is, um, we often talk about, this is really just good practice, right? Is making sure I'm actually reflecting on my teaching and thinking about how I can engage all children in the STEM pieces. All right. All right, so I'm gonna just share this um, and we want you to come back to it as well, but this is sort of a scenario for you to consider. So I want you to think about um, Miss Amy, who's a preschool teacher in a community childcare program and that she's offering a lot of opportunities for free play, um, but also provides some teacher directed activities such as storybook reading. Um, and I want you to think about that she's providing these free play activities such as housekeeping and blocks and water table. So think about what, what you might see um, in some typical early childhood programs. Um, and it's important to think about that in this class, um, she has a co uh, an assistant teacher, Miss Lee. They have 20 children and one of them is a three-year-old named Chantel um, who has Down syndrome. And they're talking about that his, um, he has an older brother um, and that they're always eager to, um, his older brother Ty loves science and building. And the family told Miss Amy that Chantel is always interested in what he's doing. So she's, so Chantel is um, included in this class. And so it's something for us to think about how could we um, think about engaging um, Chantel and all the activities, including the STEM. Can you go to the next one, Ching? Um, and so we want you to think about, and um, I know we, we want to make sure that I get to Jessica, but I do want you to take a minute to reflect on what could Miss Amy do to ensure that Chantel is included. And so I think it's really important that we, um, that we think about that. And so some of the things really are, how can we, you know, one of her goals was communication or, you know, with her speech and language delay, how could we support her in STEM using that as a vehicle to really support some of those goals. Um, and so I'll let you think about that, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. Um, if we wanna go to the um, next one, we want you to think about in this example, sorry, how you um, can change those different areas and space, variety of materials and communication. And we've given you some examples and you can find all of this on our website because uh, we think this is really important, um, but like, how can I change the, area and space, the variety of materials and communication. And so Jessica, I'm gonna turn it over to you to take us home um, and to really talk about how it can be incorporated into everyday routines and activities. Great, thank you, Megan. And yes, we are um, a little tight on time, but we should be able to get through the big ideas in these next couple of slides. We wanna talk a little bit about how STEM really does lend itself to our daily routines and activities. And then we'll touch on some of um, the resources that we have at STEMI. And I know Shawen has been posting a link to a handout that has a link to a handout. And on that handout are links to many resources that we've developed at STEM um, that you'll hear a little bit more about as we go through. But um, what sort of highlights some of the things, and this list is not at all extensive, um, there's so many daily opportunities and, and activities and routines that, um, that we as adults and teachers can integrate STEM learning into. Um, and these are just a few of them, a few examples, and I'll go through um, a few of these on these lists. So when we think about getting dressed in the morning, there's um, this idea of a first we put on our socks and then we put on our shoes. Um, we can't put on our, our shoes and then our socks. And so there's a specific order, a sequence that we need to get dressed. So we can work in this idea of computational thinking into getting dressed. We can also talk about patterns on our clothes, um, colors on our clothes, the shapes of different things that we put on our bodies um, and what they do. 
eating and cooking, and you'll see in this, the next slide some examples of resources we've already created related to um, mealtime, but eating and cooking um, lend themselves to lots of different STEM opportunities. You have an algorithm when you're following a recipe um, or putting you know, together a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I know many of us have, have heard that, um, that now it's not an analogy, but when we tell people, okay, so tell me exactly how to make a peanut butter sandwich, um, and we almost inevitably, inevitably um, forget at least one step. So um, talking about how we put things together in our, in our food is one way to integrate STEM learning. And we can also create patterns with our food, as you see in this resource that's posted. Um, you have like a banana, then a Cheerio, then a banana, then a Cheerio, then a banana, then a Cheerio. What comes next? Another Cheerio, banana. I forget which one I stopped on. I think it's banana. And then you also can see, and, and I do encourage you to, to use the links on the handout and this link in particular, because I see these um, are a little hard to read, but the, the daily routines and activities with your young child with the black border has specific adaptations that you can do during meal time so that all children are able to access um, these, these learning opportunities um, focused on STEM in daily routines. And this one is specific to meal time. This is another one of our uh, amazing resources that are in that is in development at STEMI, and this is um, related to storybooks and we have some specific resources linked to specific books that include STEM topics and some guiding questions and prompts that adults can use while they read these books with their children to facilitate STEM learning and STEM conversation and engagement in STEM um, opportunities. And then another idea that, that is perfectly integrated again into stories is this first then, like what's gonna happen next in the story? You're thinking about a, a conditional kind of a, a sequence when you're uh, encouraging that kind of conversation around a storybook. So we have another um, number of resources that are focused on changing attitudes and beliefs related to STEM. You might recognize that little boy, Alex. This is a video um, about him learning um, or being included in math learning in his schooling. And then we have a Mythbuster series and STEM Talkable podcasts, all links available on the handout. And I think the next slide, yes, this one is really important. We want you all to know that coming up in October of this year, we will have a virtual STEMI Fest that will include, um, much like North Carolina Science Fest, it includes lots of STEM focused learning opportunities, both um, recorded sessions, live sessions, question and answer sessions. Um, we have media, we had media cubbies. Yes, um, we definitely will have the Moorhead or Moorhead in our STEMI Fest this coming year. Um, and we had media cubbies where different museums and different um, resource providers created you know, additional resources for practitioners and families to access to better engage all children in STEM learning. So put this on your calendar, sign up, it's free, um, and it'll be great, I'm sure. It has and to be a cultural change. Yeah, I don't know. Do we have? I don't think we have time to play the rest of this documentary video, but you can get it. You can get to it on our website, which is linked on the handout that is in the chat. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I hate to cut yeah. things short. This has been fascinating, and I'm in awe of the work you're doing, and you're getting me all excited because we're always talking about STEM and inclusion <laughs> here at Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. And um, you know, I have so many questions about because it's not just about the children, right? It's also who is STEM for right now. It's, and we hear all the time, particularly from elementary educators and child care educators, that they may not feel um, qualified right. to integrate STEM. So this is really, really exciting to us. And thank you so much. We look forward to learning more and attending that conference in October. We're also going to share all the links and resources with all the folks who signed up across the board for, for today's activities. Um, thank you, everyone. I really, really appreciate it. Any, any final words? I, I, have a, I wasn't joking in the chat. I have a list yeah. of questions <laughs> that I want to ask. But are there, I just want to give uh, maybe one of you one final thing, anything, one thing to plug or push or anything else you want to touch on before we let you go? I think just what you said, I would plug, I'm sure they all knew I was going to speak up. Just, um, you know, reach out to us. We, we could talk about this all day. We're really passionate about inclusion in STEM. And so if you have questions, I think you have our information on our um, website and other places. And so we would love to connect you with you about um, STEM for all. 
Well, I agree with Dr. Belger, who in the chat says, super, go STEMI. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll see you down the road. Don't forget to go to ncscifest.org to find more science festival events near you and far from you, maybe, as we have <laughs> such a hybrid festival right now. You can tune in virtually like you're doing today. Thank you, everybody.